Praise the Lord, church. Happy Wednesday. We hope your week is going well, that you're staying healthy and safe. Um, we are meeting midweek remotely as a result of our quarantine, and uh, we will continue to do this this coming weekend for Easter Sunday. There'll be another uh, video posted Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, just like last week, so we encourage you to gather your family around, and um, we can watch the Sunday morning video together. And we hope that, again, everyone's staying healthy and safe. As always, you can continue to give online at thesanctuaryac.com. You can use that to pay tithes and give offerings. And uh, we'll continue to keep you updated with information. And when we feel like it's safe to return to the building via our social media platforms, as well as our one call system. So we encourage you to keep eyes and ears open on those platforms for that. Tonight, I just wanted to come and give you a word for midweek service and talk to you a little bit about setbacks and setups. On Sunday, this past Sunday, I spoke to you about challenges and promises, and we talked about how none of the challenges that we might be facing um, disqualify or invalidate the promises of God in our life, that we can and still should go out and possess everything that God has promised us. Uh, tonight, I'm going to teach on something a little bit different, but uh, in a way, kind of pick up where we left off on Sunday uh, and talk about setbacks and setups. So I'm going to start with a familiar passage of scripture in the New Testament. It's Romans chapter 8, and Paul says in verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. This is, of course, a verse that we call on a lot to help encourage us, especially when we are facing things that are a bit of a challenge for us. We find encouragement in knowing that even though all things are not necessarily good, that the God that we serve still knows how to take all things and make them work together for our good. And that gives us great hope. But if we can dive a little bit deeper into that tonight, uh, I want to try to show you that um, along the same lines of this verse from the book of Romans, the things that seem like a setback can oftentimes just be a setup for something greater. So let me show you what I mean. A few passages of scripture. The first one is in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, starting with verse 22. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And while he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus set, went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. So they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You probably know this story well. It's the account of both Jesus and Peter walking on the water. In the setting or the situation that the disciples found themselves in, they were out on a ship in the middle of a storm-tossed sea. The challenge that they were facing in the middle of that situation was the water that was out at sea. I'm not a fisherman, nor am I a boater, but I think I know enough to know that if I'm out at sea, I don't want the water coming into my vessel, and I don't want my vessel going under the water. So the challenge the disciples were facing at that moment was the danger of the water as a result of the storm. But in this particular scene, the same water that presented itself as such a great challenge to the disciples in that moment, that same water also served as the bridge that brought Peter closer to Jesus and eventually brought Jesus back onto the vessel closer to the rest of the disciples. Peter walked out there on that water, and then when he got sick, scared and he started to sink, Jesus picked him up, and together on that same water, they both walked back to the ship. And when I look at that, 
I can't help but notice that the same water that seemed like a setback also served as a setup to bring everyone in that scene closer to Jesus that night. Our challenges are not just challenges, but because we serve a God who works all things together for our good, our challenges can also be a setup. Our setbacks can also be a setup that bring us closer to the Lord. Let me give you another example. Genesis chapter 45, starting with verse 5. It says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be e uh, earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. This is, of course, one of the climactic scenes in the life of Joseph after his brothers sold him into slavery at a young age because they were so tired of dealing with his, the favoritism that their father showed him. Joseph eventually wound up in Egypt and Egypt posed a great challenge to Joseph. He shouldn't have been there to begin with. He was lied on by his master's wife while he was there. That lie got him thrown into prison and then he was forgotten about by his cellmate after the Lord had used him to interpret that cellmate's dreams. Everything about Egypt represented a challenge and a setback to Joseph. But you know the story of how Pharaoh had some dreams that nobody else could interpret. Um, but then Joseph was brought in to do what everybody else could not. And when it was all said and done, Joseph became second in command in Egypt. And he oversaw the project that Pharaoh's dream was about, which had to do with the upcoming famine and, and how to survive, how Egypt could survive that famine in the land. So when the famine finally hit, everyone else in the region was struggling to survive except for Egypt. So eventually Joseph's brothers come to Egypt looking to buy food. And that's part of what we just read here tonight. That after they have this dramatic family reunion, Joseph, tell, Joseph tells his brothers, you guys sold me here, but God actually sent me before you to preserve life. In other words, Egypt, the thing that or the place that represented Joseph's greatest challenge and perhaps greatest setback in life, that country was also a setup. It was the vehicle that God used to spare the lives of Joseph and his family in the future. And then if you want to spin it forward even further, after Joseph dies, Egypt winds up presenting itself as the nation of Israel's greatest challenge because Eventually, there came a new Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph, and he decided to enslave the Hebrew people that were living in Egypt. But then, despite all of the challenges and setbacks that 400 years of slavery bring about, that just became the stage on which God would use Moses in the future to show his supernatural delivering power. You see, every challenge and every setback can also be a setup for something greater because we serve a God who works all things together for our good. Let me give you a third example over in the book of Acts, starting with verse 19. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. The early church in the book of Acts is known for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that happens in their midst. They're known for the miracles, signs, and wonders that were performed among them, and they're known for turning their world upside down. But while all, the, all of those things are obviously great, we, make sure, we need to make sure we don't ever lose sight of the fact that they also face their share of challenges, not the least of which was physical persecution. And that persecution, according to the verses that we just read, is scattered them. And I don't know about you, but I would say that most people would agree that when a church gets scattered, that would seem to be a setback. But in the three verses that we just read from the book of Acts, that apparent setback was really just a setup for greater revival. 
because even though they were scattered, they continued to preach the gospel everywhere they went. And the Bible says that the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. What seemed to be a setback of, of persecution and scattering was really just a set up for further growth and revival. Why? Because the God that we serve knows how to make all things work together for the good. So once again, I'm coming to you remotely on a Wednesday night to tell you that we're certainly facing some challenges right now. And sometimes those challenges feel like setbacks. But what the word of the Lord shows me is even a setback can turn into a setup for something greater. That's a, that's a message that we need to hold on to as a church family. It's a message that you might need to hold on to personally in your own life. Don't view every setback as a source of discouragement because maybe it's a setup for something greater. And the reason why we can have that hope is because our Bible says our God works all things together for the good. And actually that verse in Romans that we started off with tonight, that's kind of the punchline. That's the, the, the go-to verse of scripture that we know and love so much. But if you take a look at the verses before that one, and even some of the ones after it, there's actually a lot of meat on that bone that can really bless us. Look at what Paul says in that same chapter, Romans 8, but starting up in verse uh, 18. Pardon the technical difficulties here. If you're following along in your Bible, we're in Romans 8, and we're going to start in verse number 18. And I'm going to read it from the NIV. But what Paul says here is, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There's an acknowledgement there that there is some present suffering, that there are some things that happen to us that feel like a setback. But don't ever forget, Paul said, there's glory that's going to be revealed in us. There is an eternity that we're living for that we must not forget about and not lose sight of, even if we might be suffering in the present. Then jumping down to verse 22, Paul says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, he says, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, and we wait for it patiently. Church, we have a hope that we can't see yet, and that's the hope of eternity. It's the hope of heaven. And if we really allow it to, Every setback we experience here on earth can really just be a vehicle that helps put us that much closer to that eternal hope. But if, because if we allow it to, the Lord can help us take everything we learn and receive from our setbacks and use it to help us become that much more ready for that great day. Paul goes on to say, uh, he says down in verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Are you struggling this evening with a setback? Why not take it to the Lord in prayer? Why not do what Paul teaches about here and pray in the spirit why not let the holy ghost work in you and encourage your spirit praying for things that you may not even know how to pray about and you're on your own let your setback be a setup for a demonstration of god's power so that's when paul says that verse that we started off with about how all things work together for the good but then if you jump down to verse 31 a couple verses after our our jumping off point tonight Look at what Paul says uh, to close out this eighth chapter of Romans. He asks, what then shall we say in response to these things? When you consider all of this, what, what is one thing we can conclude? He says, if God is for us, 
who can be against us. Church, when even your setbacks can be used for something good, when you serve a God like that, it's no wonder Paul asked the question, if God is on your side, what does it matter who might not be or what might not be on your side? We all know setbacks aren't fun. I know that they're not desirable. I know we'd much rather be having church in the building, doing church like normal right now. I know that the situation in your life that has caused you to take a detour or slowed things down for you, I know none of that is convenient. But friend, when you serve a God that can work all things for your good, when you have a hope that goes beyond this world, when your setbacks can be used as setups for something greater, then don't get discouraged tonight. Be encouraged and keep your eyes open for what that setup might be. Keep an eye out for the bridge that leads you closer to Jesus like the water did for Peter. Keep an eye out for that land that God sends you to ahead of time so that he can prepare the way for provision just like he did Joseph and the Hebrew people. Keep an eye out for the revival that gets birth as a result of your struggle in the moment just like he did for the early church in the book of Acts. When you live for God, setbacks don't have to just be setbacks. They can be set ups for something greater. Now look at what Paul says to close out this chapter. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Everything he listed to close out that chapter of Romans, I would contend is a setback. He, he talks about... Um, Famine and nakedness and peril and distress and tribulation and sword and, you know, being like a sheep to the slaughter and, and height and depth and, and, and angels and principalities and powers and spirit. All these things, they're all potential setbacks. But none of it, he said, can separate you from the love of God. Don't ever forget that the God you serve, he's not just working things for your good, but he loves you. He loves you with an unconditional love. And sometimes just to know that God loves you is enough encouragement to keep you in the middle of a challenge or a setback that you might be facing tonight. It's enough to keep you in what we are facing as a church family. God, the God of the universe loves you and he is working all things together for our good. Keep an eye out for how your setback might just be a setup for something greater. I pray this is a word that encourages you on this Wednesday night. Let's close in prayer um, as we dismiss in our home church tonight. Thank you today for your blessings, God, in our life and everything you do for us and with us and how you work all things together for our good. We pray, God, that you would help us in every challenge we're facing collectively and every challenge we're facing as a church family. That you would give us peace, that you'd encourage those who are struggling in their spirit right now. We continue to pray for your healing virtue to touch our bodies as many of us deal with this virus. And I pray that all of us are touching our spirit, God, that we would be able to see the things that you are doing to set up something greater in our life. Every challenge, every obstacle, every opposition, God, let it be a setup for something greater. We thank you for the faithfulness of your people. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord God, and pray that you continue to keep us the remainder of this week until we can gather again. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you for an Easter Sunday video Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless you.